Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Randall Hansen about his book titled War, Work and Want, How the OPEC Oil Crisis Caused Mass Migration and Revolution, published by Oxford University Press in 2023. This book asks a really interesting question. Essentially, why did global migration triple after 1970? And what does this have to do with the OPEC oil crisis? The book covers a whole bunch of different events and times and places and creates really fascinating threads to tie things together in ways that maybe we don't always. So, Randall, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast to take us through your book. Uh, Thanks for having me. Before we dive into the book, could you please introduce yourself a little bit and explain why you decided to write this book. Uh, Yes, so I am uh, a political scientist and uh, a research chair in global migration at the University of Toronto, and I've been working on the topic uh, for over two uh, decades now, and really two things motivated this book. Uh, First was the the puzzle, as it were, which which you already introduced, and that is to say, There's all sorts of reasons that I go into in the book. Uh, The guest worker programs ended, the economy uh, tanked, uh, colonial migration to Europe, so-called colonial migration was was drawn down. All sorts of reasons to expect that global migration should have fallen or at least stagnated uh, after the 1970s and above all after 1973. Uh, And in fact, it tripled. So one question was why? Uh, The second is a bit of a reaction to the migration literature which in my view has become overly obsessed with questions of identity and above all uh, so-called Muslim immigrants. That's in fact a complete construction, but Muslim immigrants in Europe, their integration, questions of Islam. And I, feel, I, feel like, I felt like that focus was um, overdone and in some sense misconceived. And I wanted to go back to the future. And that is to have in this book a focus on economics and class. All right. That makes sense as a problem statement um, and as a goal. Nice and succinct to start us off. So thank you for that foundation. Um, I imagine listeners might assume, perhaps, from what you and I have both mentioned so far, that the book starts with 1973 or maybe 1970 with the OPEC oil crisis, perhaps. But in fact, the book starts with the Six-Day War in 1967. Why? Well, the OPEC oil embargo of 73, uh, which lasted six months, and more importantly, the quadrupling in real terms of oil prices, which lasted a decade, should not have happened. And why is that? Well, that's because cartels are extraordinarily difficult uh, to enforce, to make work. All past attempts by OPEC to permanently raise oil prices Uh, had collapsed basically because of a free rider problem. That's to say any one member of OPEC would have an interest in the general price being raised through the others cutting supply while it continued to pump out oil and capture uh, more revenues at that higher price. But the result is everyone did that. Uh, So the price revaluations, the price rises never worked. Why did it happen in 1973? Well, it worked then because the 1967 Six-Day War and above all Israel's expansion of its borders, its its land grab, so enraged Arab opinion that it overcame the collective action problem and created the sort of solidarity necessary to make OPEC work. That's one reason. The second reason, and we may get into this later, is the book looks at the refugee work nexus. And the Six-Day War was really the start of that. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean a situation in which war turns people into refugees, but when they arrive in the first country of asylum, or the second country of asylum for that matter, uh, they are put to work, they become a reservoir of cheap labor, and that's exactly what happened with the Palestinians after 1967. Uh, So for those two reasons, Uh, overcoming the collective action problem and the refugee work nexus, I start with the Six-Day War. So let's then take kind of and continue your mention of those things and see what they look like a bit kind of 
if we move on from the Six Day War, on from the initial moment of um, kind of OPEC declaring this in 1973, to kind of see how these things start to come together in real life. So I'd love to ask you to tell us a bit about Egypt and what are the trends, the reasons that are converging after the Six Day War, after the moment of 1973, um, what happens to Egypt? How does this all come together in not just Egypt, I will say, obviously, we're doing a bit of a highlights tour of the book, we're probably not going to get into every country that you mention. But if we take Egypt as our example, how do we see some of these things already come together in this country in the 70s and 80s? Yes, and that's an excellent question. It also takes us back a bit to 1967. Because the Six Day War, one of its consequences was the utter destruction of Nasserism, uh, secularism and state socialism, let's define it that way, as a, a basis of Egyptian and wider Arab, wider Middle Eastern identity. And after that, uh, when Sadat came to power in Egypt, he did a couple of things. The first is to enter a Faustian pact with the political Islamists whom Nasser had imprisoned. He released them, he promoted them, and he turned to neoliberalism. He abandoned import substitution industrialization. He had to for reasons that we could talk about, really, and adopted classic neoliberal or liberal capitalist uh, measures, uh, cutting tariffs, cutting subsidies, welcoming foreign uh, investment. And that led, as ever, to some wealth and to great inequality. Now, while that was happening, um, Saudi Arabia the Gulf states in general, but Saudi Arabia, after the uh, great increase in oil prices, was going through an extraordinary boom, and it needed massive numbers of migrant laborers. And those were chiefly from other Arab countries at the beginning, later South Asian countries, and above all, Egypt. So huge numbers of labor migrants moved to Saudi Arabia. And so we've got neoliberalism and inequality in Egypt, a promotion of the political Islamists, uh, a massive numbers of labor migrants in Saudi Arabia. And they, those labor migrants arrived in a country with a much more conservative view of Islam than that which they had at home in Egypt. And those labor migrants in Saudi Arabia got a midlife education in basically Wahhabi extremism. Final factor, one of Nasser's great accomplishments had been a huge expansion in free university education. So large numbers of Egyptians skilled up, got educated. And let's jump ahead to the 1980s. All of these trends converged at once. Oil prices in Saudi Arabia collapsed. Massive numbers of labor migrants returned home. You had a, a political situation in which political Islamists had been indulged. This changed after Sadat's assassination, but in a sense, the genie uh, was out of the bottle. And you had large numbers of university graduates coming into a stagnant 1980s economy. That mix was toxic. Now, don't get me wrong, most political Islamist activity involved in providing services that the neoliberal state could not. Uh, but for a, a a small minority, a minority of Islamists, there was a turn to terrorism. So the violence that we saw in Egypt in the 1990s, uh, attacks in Egypt, uh, massacres in, in Luxor, these were the consequence of a convergence of trends in the 1970s. So that's indulgence of the Islamists, a turn to neoliberalism, leading to massive inequality and fr frustrations, labor migration and return migration, and frustrated university graduates. It was a, a, a toxic mix. So that answer alone, I think, is a fabulous um, example of what I mentioned earlier, of this book bringing together threads of, oh, wait, hadn't thought of those together in that way, or hadn't thought of the cause and effect in that sense. And it's very much in that same sort of vein, I'd like to ask my next question, which on the face of it might seem very unrelated, but I promise is not. Um, 
in addition to explaining what is happening in Egypt and some other countries in terms of this combination of religiosity, uh, migration, university education, you also make the argument in the book that we can really understand the oil crisis as having a direct thread, um, varying degrees of direct, but a more direct thread than we might expect to some pretty important wars. So how can we understand the influence of oil and oil prices if we turn to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Uh, so to step back a book, what I uh, step step back a bit, what I say early in the book is that the oil crisis, in a sense, um, it, it did two things. One is it sort of turbocharged factors that were present in the 1960s. Inflation was ticking up on the back of the Vietnam War and American spending. Nasserism was challenged. The Egyptian economy was already in a little bit of trouble, uh, and it gave that all of that an absolute kick. It tur- turbocharges, as I say. At the same time, it was sort of a political big bang with consequences reverberating out for decades. And one of those, as you rightly say, related to the Soviet Union. Let's jump ahead uh, to 1979. And uh, Moscow has a puppet regime in Kabul in Afghanistan. Uh, which is tottering in the face of a rural rebellion. Now, what you need to know is that the Soviet Union had been stealing Afghan gas uh, for decades, uh, mining it and buying it nominally from Afghanistan, but at uh, massively deflated prices. That was the context of 79. That tottering regime had made 14 requests over 1979, the course of 1979, for the Soviet Union to invade and save it. The Politburo turned down all of them. But what was happening at the same time, the Iranian Revolution, uh, which also was a consequence of 1973 for reasons we could go into, the Iranian Revolution led to the second oil shock of the 1970s, just when we thought it was safe to go to the petrol station again, oil prices shot up, and that engendered two consequences in the Soviet Union. Uh, The first was petromania, a delusional belief funded by this massive surge in oil revenues that politics had no limits, that all things were possible, that the invasion, an invasion would work, and above all, that it would be easy to pay for. And secondly, it made the retention of stolen natural gas in the context of escalating prices. The Soviet Union was both an importer and exporter of natural gas. It made that essential. So those two commodity commodity related reasons, both of them were the consequences of 1973, were factors, not the only factors, but were factors that led Moscow to invade um, Kabul, sorry, to invade, the, uh, to invade Afghanistan. And that, in turn, have massive consequences. I don't know if we should mention them or, or, or wait. I mean, we're already here, so if you'd like to, go for it. Okay, well, well what happened then, uh, much like uh, early 2022, the Soviet Union thought it would win a quick victory, install a puppet regime, and go home. But Afghan resistors uh, declared uh, jihad. Uh, the Mujahideen formed, and they offered massive resistance to the Soviet Union. And they were basically imposing uh, one tactical defeat after another on the Soviets. And the Soviets' response to that was what one observer called migratory genocide. They bathed the Soviet countryside in bombs and mines, the mines designed, among other things, to blow the limbs off men, women, and indeed children. Some deliberately look like toys that children would pick up. And the goal in that was to drive Afghans, all Afghans, not just resistors, not just the Mujahideen, into the cities, which they controlled, or out of the country. It did both. Five million ended up in Iran and Pakistan, two and three million, respectively. In northern Pakistan, Afghan refugees rotting in refugee camps, being preached a intolerant version of Islam 
by semi-literate mullahs, they became the Taliban. So oil informed the Soviet invasion, which led to massive refugees, which led to the Taliban. And we could follow the lines of history further. Uh, the Taliban housed Osama bin Laden, who himself partially radical, radicalized in those various refugee camps. And then we get 9-11, uh, the NATO invasion of, of, of Afghanistan in 2001, and collectively millions of war and oil-driven refugees. Hmm. Thank you for taking us through how those pieces come together. I'd like to turn to the United States, if we can at this point, um, because so far we've been talking about um, impacts of the oil crisis nearer to where many OPEC countries are um, geographically and in some senses nearer in time, but the book doesn't stop there. The book makes some further claims about the impact of oil shocks. So if we turn to the United States, can you take us through how oil shocks made the assault on American unions possible? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and the book is really divided into two parts. Uh, the first half uh, looks at the geopolitical consequences and some economic consequences of, of the oil crisis, chiefly in the Middle East, and how oil-driven wars led to 22 million unexpected refugees. That's the first half. The second half looks at the way in which the oil crisis led to the reconfiguring of uh, Western OECD, but in a sense also global capitalism. Asia is part of that story uh, in a very, very fundamental way. But let's let's tie it to the states, as you said. So what happened in uh, 1973? Well, in America, as everywhere, after the OPEC oil crisis, economic growth which had been on a tear, which had been five or six percent in the 1950s and the 1960s and the early 1970s, actually surging just before OPEC. These were what the French called the 30 glorious years. OPEC halved, the OPEC oil crisis halved economic growth, and we've stayed there ever since. Ever since. We've had five decades of low growth and stagnating wages. So middle-class wages have not increased since the 1970s. Well, when that happened, commentators, journalists, conservative politicians, they all defined inflation in the United States, which was a result of the OPEC oil crisis, not as the result of an energy shock, but as a wage problem as a consequence of greedy American unions. And uh, conservatives in Congress and conservative think tanks saw their moment. They had opposed unions. They had opposed redistributive social spending. Remember, remember that in the 1960s, American taxes were ha far higher than, than European uh, taxes. And they had opposed the New Deal and the entire heritage of the New Deal. They saw their moment blaming economic stagnation and inflation on the unions, on the New Deal, on social spending, allowed them to savage the unions. And when Ronald Reagan came to power, his defining, one of his defining first initiatives was to absolutely break the air traffic controllers union that went on a technically illegal strike, one could argue, but went on, on strike in violation of a return to work order. Uh, he busted the union. He arrested them. The American labor movement never recovered. In the context of a federal assault and a corporate assault, uh, hiring lawyers and management consultants uh, to destroy the unions, to prevent unions from being formed, this led to absolutely plunging American unionization rates and spiraling uh, inequality. All of that was made possible again by OPEC. So in this context, then, we see the rise of business models that are not uh, concerned about union minimum wages and, in fact, very much focus on having a low wage, low benefit model. 
the most famous one, um, certainly that I can think of, and you talk about in the book, is Walmart. What impact in this context of the unions collapsing, how does this then link back to the earlier point and theme of the book in terms of global migration? Yeah, so what uh, firms like Walmart uh, did was a couple of things. Uh, Domestically, they absolutely debased wages in their own sector, the retail sector. Um, So Sam Walton uh, basically moved department stores, let's call Walmart a department store, out of uh, Chicago and Boston and New York, uh, union, uh, you, you know, uh, heavily unionized cities uh, where the department stores were owned by often German Jewish owners who were, uh, who were uh, sympathetic to the unions, uh, taking advantage of the American highway system, uh, a product of state socialism, if one exists. Uh, they, Walmart moved its forms, massive box stores, to the countryside in the rural south where the unions were weak. They paid their workers nothing, and they used those those low wages to sell cheap products, everyday low prices, as I think the slogan goes. As those wages fell further and further, and as Walmart ran out of even southern rural workers prepared to work for very low wages, uh, the retail sector like other sectors, had no choice but to ch- turn to migrant labor. So cheap migrant labor was imported as a substitute for domestic workers. Now, I want to be very clear about the causal lines in this because it's become fashionable among conservatives in the United Kingdom, for example, to blame low wages on immigration. This is absolutely false. The low wages result from conservative, and the Tories are, of course, in power in the UK, a conservative destruction of uh, the British and the American labor movement. And when wages collapse and conditions deteriorated, domestic workers were not prepared to work in those sectors, and then migrants came in. So the causal lines are entirely different from what conservatives argue. It's not that immigration is the cause of low wages, Rather, it's the effect of low wages, which has other causes, namely conservative policy. Uh, Now, I realize I'm going on a bit, but the main point there is the debasing of wages. But there was then a second effect of Walmart and also Amazon, these big conglomerates. Uh, When they sourced their clothes, uh, their food, um, their other products, Walmart uses its massive buying power to tell suppliers it wants a certain number of products with these specifications on this day at this price. And if we, Walmart, don't get it, we will go elsewhere. Suppliers, sometimes domestically, but mostly in in, uh, the Global South, mostly in Asia, uh, the one factor, price factor, that suppliers can control is wages, and they squeeze them. So the result was, if we take the clothing sector, for example, uh, in Thailand, in northern Thailand, in May Sot, you have a whole series of firms that are uh, supplying textiles, supplying garments, supplying clothes to Western buyers at incredibly low wages, well below the Thai minimum wage. And the only way to get those uh, people prepared to work for that is through migrant labor, often trafficked migrant labor from Myanmar or Cambodia. So the kind of dynamics that we're seeing uh, post OPEC, defining inflation as a wage problem, debasing wages, bringing in migrants to do work that domestic workers are not willing to do. This is occurring in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in the rest of Europe, but also in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia in this case. So it is a truly global phenomenon. And one that's not restricted to the retail sector either. Um, So I'm wondering if we can maybe expand this discussion beyond that sector and look at meatpacking and processing and agriculture. 
Yes, absolutely. And those two sectors share <clears throat> exactly the same characteristics. Or t- the first two share the same uh, characteristics, retail and meat packing or meat processing. These were sectors that were once well-paid, unionized, where working class jobs supported fairly affluent working class lives, either because the, jo- the the sector itself was, was heavily unionized, like meatpacking, or in retail, because those unions that exist kind of set the standards for the whole sector. So the non-unionized firm, given the strength of the union, said, well, we don't want unions, but the only way to keep them out is to treat our workers well. So you had a whole section of affluent working class uh, jobs. Once the unions were destroyed, uh, wages were debased, migrant workers were brought in. So the meatpacking and the meat processing sector, uh, like the retail sector, in fact, even more than the real t- retail sector, is um, entirely dependent on cheap migrant labor, sometimes child labor, and the conditions in which those migrants toil are absolutely abysmal. Now, jumping to agriculture, the same dynamic occurs with a couple of qualifications. The moment of unionization was later, uh, just in the early 1970s. It was more tepid and it was brief. It was basically at the moment of the Delano grape strike. And then in an irony of history, the Teamsters uh, teaming up with President Nixon uh, uh, destroyed um, the unions and agriculture plunged back to what it had always been highly dependent on migrant labor. But through all those those three sectors, uh, there's a huge dependence on migrant labor, which is a function of the terrible conditions, which are a matter of political and economic choice. Uh, there's something else that I'd like to add about that, if I may. Please. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> in the story so far, we've made governments and firms uh, the villains in the piece. And indeed, they do have a lot to answer for, uh, but they're not the only ones. Uh, the book is called uh, War, Work, and Want. And I think we're seeing the picture emerge here. War drives out refugees. Uh, labor migrants migrate for work, for any work. But there's want. What is want? Well, what want is, is our, uh, in the West in particular, but in rich countries in general, our insatiable desire for ever cheaper food and products, the desire to pay less and less and ideally nothing for more and more. And part of the story of the wage debasement we've seen since 1973 is firms satisfying those consumer impulses, the desire for cheap sunglasses, for fast fashion, for everything immediately and cheap. But in the 50-year history, what it also means is that the way in which the middle class responded to wage, wage stagnation is by rebuilding its standard of living on the back of falling consumer prices, which themselves occurred because of falling wages and cheap migrant labor. And this There was sort of a personal anecdote to begin this. I recall, and I I discussed this in one of the chapters of the book, uh, shopping in the 1980s when I was just a kid uh, for jumpers at uh, the equivalent of um, Sears in in Canada. And I bought uh, jumpers, bought sweaters for about $50 each. They cost exactly that today. So in real terms, the price of clothing has fallen dramatically. And what I do in one section of the book is estimate the real fall in a wide range of products, clothes, uh, shoes, uh, sporting equipment, furniture, and so on. And what we see is that they have fallen dramatically. So what we hear about all the time from the left, and rightly so, is that our wages have stagnated. What we don't hear is that our middle class standards of living, and anyone who was alive then will recognize this, are massively higher than they were in the 1980s. This is partly a story of technology and the iPhone itself, incidentally, very dependent on cheap labor, 
but it's also a function of the way in which prices for all goods have fallen. And that is a story of wage debasement, destroyed unions, uh, and cheap migrant labor. And this is really quite striking across these different sectors that you've discussed so far. Um, and I'm wondering kind of the extent to which we can extend it further um, across additional sectors. And so I wonder if maybe you can talk about the dynamics that we see in domestic labor and to what extent we see similarities to the stories you've told us so far versus maybe some differences? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, domestic labor, uh, cleaners, uh, uh, nannies, caregivers for uh, the elderly, we in a sense see exactly the same dynamics, a huge number of uh, migrants, uh, you know, while in one breath, uh, Prime Minister Maloney of Italy is ranting against migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean. What she's not mentioning is basically every Italian family has a uh, grandmother, grandfather in their 80s or even their 90s that's entirely dependent on the care offered by uh, a, a, an immigrant. So you have low wages, massive numbers of migrants. In that sense, it looks like meatpacking or retail or construction. But what makes it different is really two things. One, there was no moment of unionization. It was really only after the 1970s in, pro in response to uh, a spread of wealth through Asia in response to massive inequality, where a small number of workers in the West earned a huge amount of money, and in response to a more positive development, the large scale of, of, of entry of women into the labor market, it was only then after the unions were busted that you got this huge demand for domestic uh, laborers. Uh, at the same time, uh, the private sphere is incredibly hard for unions to organize, obviously. So even if it had occurred earlier, let's say in the early 1960s, it's doubtful uh, that uh, the unions could have organized uh, domestic laborers. Thank you for taking us through that one. Again, bringing things together, we wouldn't necessarily um, put in the same sort of analysis. But the book, I don't want to just... I mean, we could, I'm sure, talk much more about other uh, sectors that are impacted in this way in terms of what we buy or the labor we pay for. I'd like to turn, however, to another section of the book, um, where we live. How did the OPEC, OPEC crisis and oil impact that aspect? Uh, yes, construction is, is, is fascinating. And, you know, it's the same argument for all. The sec the, all the sectors I look at in, in the book. So in a sense, it's the same dynamic, although intensified in some ways. So again, go back to the 1970s, the, the um, middle classes and the upper middle classes uh, were merciless in their pursuit of lower prices as a way of mastering inflation, getting around inflation and stagnating wages. So in a sense, they wanted cheaper housing. Yet, housing is a different sort of good because it's both a consumption good. We live in our houses. We, we wear them down. And it's an asset good or an asset class. We depend on rising house prices to underpin a sense of almost false sense of middle class affluence. The United Kingdom is a superlative example of this. Uh, but so is the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, the English speaking world in particular, Ireland, and so on. Uh, so there's an interest in rising prices. At the same time, new consumers, uh, young people, want to get into the housing market. And until recently, they're locked out at the moment, they did so. How were all these circles squared? Well, firms kept the price of houses lower than they would otherwise have been by again attacking the unions, um, lowering wages, removing benefits, and bringing in migrant workers. And I go through a few anecdotes in the book uh, in Los Angeles of one unionized worker um, uh, born in the United States, 
working next to a non-unionized Latino migrant laborer. They do exactly the same job. The American earns uh, much more money, uh, has, has company benefits, has paid holidays, and the recent Latino migrant has none of that. So now, as in the other sectors, um, I want to choose my language uh, carefully. Those born in the United States tend not, uh, almost never go into construction. Those who do are migrant laborers. And they are a classic example uh, of Marx's uh, reserve of disposable labor. Why? Because when the economy turns down, and housing, of course, is a classically cyclical sector, they're incredibly easy to sack. So during the spectacular 2008 U.S. housing crash, 300,000 workers were fired in construction, and they were basically all immigrants. So of all of the sectors I look at, uh, construction is actually better paid than any of them, uh, but it's a shadow of its former self because of exactly the same post-1973 dynamics with this added twist that in a sense we have falling wages in the context of rising prices and that makes construction different from say meat packing or garments and textiles. Speaking of garments and textiles next in fact why is Turkey the example that you end the chapter that's about textiles and fabrics? Why is Turkey the end of that chapter? Yeah, I start the book with um, an anecdote in Italy to demonstrate the way in which uh, the textile and garment sector was once the purview of uh, domestic workers who earn decent wages and uh, is now again an entirely wage debased sector. And I end with uh, Turkey uh, for a couple of reasons. Partly it links back to the oil driven refugees at the start of the book. Uh, but most importantly, it explores a theme that runs through the book, and that is the refugee work nexus, or the way in which refugees are turned into laborers. So refugees flee their countries, and I hope the British Home Secretary is listening, to stay alive. We know this. They flee to save their lives. But once they arrive in new countries, above all in the global south, they have no choice but to work to stay alive. And so across the world, Palestinians in Israel before October, uh, Afghans in Iran, Syrians in Turkey, Sudanese in Libya, Cambodians in Thailand, refugees are toiling in the most appalling conditions, working in, tax, in toxic waste dumps, um, working in sweatshops, producing clothing. And in the case of the Syrians in Turkey, they are producing clothing above all for fast fashion firms in Europe. So again, they are supporting our standard of living. And the example of Syrian garment workers in Turkey really ties together uh, the two themes of the book, uh, the war, actually all three, the war, the work, and the want. War-driven refugees who are put to work to supply demand in the West generated by a post-OPEC debasing in wages and destruction of the unions. So what you've been telling us so far is clearly a global story, um, is clearly affecting pretty much every sector we can think of, um, up to and including what we wear and where we live. Was this inevitable? Were different decisions possible in 1973? Well, yes. In a sense, some countries took them. So if we go to the, the Nordic countries, Sweden, uh, Denmark, Finland, uh, what we find there is that they made different choices. So they faced the same oil shock, obviously. They had to cope with inflation. But rather than turning on the unions, they decided to work with them. They trimmed social spending to get their budgets uh, back into something close to balance, but they massively increased spending on training, training workers who lost uh, their, their jobs. Um, 
unionizing, unionization rates remained high, very high in Denmark and Sweden, inequality is relatively low. The unions, though, in those countries are more cooperative. So this is a hard model to replicate. And while I've really placed the blame in this podcast where it belongs on, on governments, firms, and us, I don't let the unions in North America and Britain entirely off the hook. Um, you know, they, they, they pursued an insider-outsider strategy. They attempted and failed to maintain their privileges for a set of chiefly white male workers. They did little to organize African Americans. They did little to organize the sectors that were rapidly expanding and that were highly gendered, i.e. that many women were in, in the servant sector in the 1970s. Uh, their leaders were, were sexist, they were homophobic. They were often, think of the Teamster, Teamsters, thoroughly corrupt, consorting with um, uh, the mob. So the unions are not, are not guiltless in North America. But in Nordic Europe, uh, it's a very different story. They cooperated with the government uh, to make the sort of adjustments that were necessary to cope with inflation and uh, to cope with uh, Asian competition and to maintain well-paid working class jobs. It worked there, uh, but I don't think it'd be replicated. A, because of different union structures, I've said. B, because Nordics pay tax rates that um, Britons, Americans, Canadians, and even French and German nationals would find intolerable. Uh, so it's very hard to take that model and export it elsewhere. Also, it depends on the nature of the economy. So in a sense, the Germans to a degree pursued a Nordic strategy. Again, the unions are more cooperative. They see themselves as stakeholders in the productive process, not as an enemy of, of firms. So Ger Germany to this day has a larger um, well-paid, unionized, uh, working-class sector, but it also has a massive low-wage sector, uh, the highest in Europe after uh, the United Kingdom. Why is that? Well, both Sweden and Germany are export-based economies, but German exports are highly, highly price-sensitive. That is, if the price uh, goes up, uh, they won't sell abroad. Sweden is much more in tech. They own Spotify, for example, and there you can raise prices. My Spotify subscription went up, I think, by 50% a few months ago. I didn't bat an eye. Um, the Swedes are able to raise, raise prices to keep wages high. The Germans are not. So the German economy, uh, the largest in Europe, is thoroughly dependent on, on low wages. So I've, I've gone on a bit, but I hope that answers the question on, on the No, Nordic. it does. No, thank, thank you for that. Um, it very much does. Um, if we think then, kind of, if we've gone into the big picture questions of was this inevitable? Was there another way? Um, I have another big picture question to ask you. In fact, my penultimate one. Obviously, this book tells us a lot about how things happened, um, in some senses, how we got to where we are now. And I think also says something perhaps about where we might be going. And in fact, you say towards the end of the book that the 2020s may be when labor and migration history reach a turning point, but also that it might be when they fail to make that turn. So if we move more to where we're at now, can you take us through what you are saying here? Uh, yes, I, I, I end the book by plagiarizing, not for the first time, A.G.P. Taylor. Um, yes, there was this moment of um, foolish middle age optimism when I was writing this book. Yeah, it was 2020 in the midst of some interminable lockdown. And I thought things have finally changed uh, because of the way in which we, the secure middle class behind our computers working from home, were so dependent on food and Amazon deliveries to keep alive. I thought we're see finally seeing a revaluation of working class labor. Uh, inflation seemed to be dead forever and governments pre were prepared to spend a huge amount of money. I thought we might be at the at, at, on the onset of a paradigm shift. Well, my optimism, like optimism often, was entirely misplaced. And what I think now, a couple of years later, is that the, the 2020s look incredibly like the 1970s. So think about this. Uh, a Democratic president came to power in an atmosphere of relief and optimism after four years of a 
corrupt Republican regime. That didn't last long. His popularity slumped partly because of a disastrous military pullout that made the Americans look weak, but more importantly in the face of economic stagnation. One. Two, Russia invaded another sovereign and country. Three, an oil embargo was again deployed, oil and gas, and the inflation took off. So the world in which we're living now, economic stagnation, uh, 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 war, uh, inflation, looks very much like the 1970s, but it's in fact much worse. Because in the 1970s, the oil shock, the inflation, the stagnation occurred after three decades of the highest economic growth in history, of rising working class wages. The male working class wage in America peaked in 1972. It's been on a long decline since. And what I should have said much earlier, but I think it's been implicit in what I said, is that whereas middle class wages have stagnated from the 70s, working class wages have, of course, plummeted above all for working class men. That's part of the story of Trump. That's part of the story of uh, Brexit. So we're in a situation which is in some ways similar, in some ways worse, yet we face the same set of choices. And what I suspect is going to happen is that the world is not going to change. We are going to remain dependent on cheap migrant on, on cheap wages to support stagnant, even falling standards of living, that that, that, that wage labor will be increasingly migrant, um, that will become only intensified as, as the population ages, for example, in Europe, we need still more uh, caregiver, caregivers. And all the trends I talk about in the book, um, migrant labor, migrant abuses, human trafficking, all of that's going to continue and uh, quite likely increase. So, as I say, we might be facing a point where um, history reaches a turning point and yet it fails to turn. On that, maybe not the most optimistic note, but I think a very important one, um, that takes me to my final question. This book is obviously out. Uh, people can go read it, uh, read the case studies that we didn't get a chance to mention or read more detail. Is there anything then, now that this is done, that you might have your eye on next, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like to preview? Uh, yes, I do. But I'm afraid I'm probably not going to cheer you up, Miranda. Uh, I'm, <laughs> looking, I'm looking at um, at refugees in, in, in Europe, so a, a slightly more narrow view. And, and, and part of my interest there. I mean, I call the book perhaps a bit pompously global, uh, but people have rightly pointed out that I don't pay enough attention to Africa. I look at Asia, I look at um, the Americas, I look at Europe, and I look at the Middle East. The, the next book is looking at refugee flows, Middle Eastern, but also African, uh, to uh, Europe. And uh, when I give PowerPoint presentations, I have a slide showing the six sectors that I, I look at in the book, and in the middle of that, I have a, a, a picture of uh, bodies in a gymnasium in Italy. And these are refugees who drowned in the Mediterranean. We're now living in a world in Europe in which we block, block, block the boats coming across the Mediterranean. We send them back to Libya, a state incidentally that the French and British destroyed avowedly where those refugees end up in, in torture camps. And if they survive all of that, if they land in Lampedusa, if they make it to Italy and generally try and make it north to Germany, they end up um, cleaning our floors, delivering uh, our food, uh, working in our homes, cleaning our houses. So we live in this perverse world where we need cheap migrant labor there are no channels for it to come to Europe, so it's forced through uh, refugee channels. And we reject that labor that we need really to the point of, uh, of killing people. So I want to explore refugees and migration in Europe and make a, a plea really to Europeans to recognize, which they're denying, their dependence on cheap migrant labor and to open 
channels for it as a partial, partial, a partial solution, not, a, not an entire one, a partial solution to the refugee crisis, uh, and to make uh, those terrible lives a little bit better. Uh, but the part of the interest in that book is continuing to look at the ways in which uh, oil-driven wars, because Syria is a, a chapter I look in the book as well, are continuing to affect contemporary European uh, and global politics. Well, as you said, not optimistic, but still incredibly important. So thank you for sharing that preview with us. And while you're working on that book, of course, listeners can read the book we've been discussing titled War, Work and Want, How the OPEC Oil Crisis Caused Mass Migration and Revolution, published by Oxford University Press in 2023. Randall, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Uh, Thank you very much for having had me.